This is part one of two in being offered to travel in a caravan across Africa. In the last episode, I stated I met a Tuareg nomad in a dungy cafe on an oasis in the Sahara, and he insisted that I travel with his camel caravan. In our long talks, I learned of his life, his culture, his philosophy of life, and experiences of the world. He learned of my passion for adventure, my fascination with travel, my interest in culture, my ability to fight through harm, and my talent for survival. The offer was open, meaning I could travel with them for as long as I wanted. Essentially, he was asking me to be a Tuareg nomad. The first part of the invitation was a six-week, 2,000-mile, 3,200-kilometer journey to Timbuktu. This was an ancient trade route meandering through the mountains and had been used long before written history. No American and only one European had done this trip. The second stint would be on to the countries of Mauritania, Senegal, and Gambia, then back through Mali and on to the countries of Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, and Sudan. I would be the first Westerner to do that whole trip. In my mind, I thought if I could endure that, if I had survived, I could have gone on in other caravans to the countries of the Central African Republic, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Yemen, and elsewhere in Africa. This would be over 25,000 miles, 40,000 kilometers on my feet as the camels were used for carrying trade goods. My hosts don't live on schedules, but the trip probably required three to five years. I knew this would be one of the great trips of the last 100 years by someone from the West and would be the highlight of my life. I would have disappeared from the modern world, probably not having any glimpses of it for the entire trip. I am sure the caravans would stop briefly on the very outskirts of capital cities of Nouakchott, Dakar, Bamako, Niamey, and N'Djamena, but I suspected the stops would only be at Tuareg trade camps, far enough away to show no evidence of urban development. I would covered the explorer Richard F. Burton in previous episodes. I believe him to be the greatest adventurer traveler in history. This would have been an impressive trip even for him, and maybe in many ways greater than anything he did. I understand a short time before I was in the Sahara, the first Westerners crossed the Sahara from west to east. But I wouldn't have just crossed it. I would try to cover all the major trade routes, and I would have considered a return trip using the northern countries of Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and back to Morocco. I would think that such a trip would be easily publishable and possibly offer a decent amount of compensation. But neither publishing nor money were the main interest. My interests were in seeing all these cultures, to live among them, to intimately see and experience the Sahara. I knew as the variety of cultures was dying, I might be both the first and the last to be able to see, to be able to make this trip among the traditional cultures. I don't believe the trip in what I was looking at has been done by anyone. My mind was occupied with what the trip could be. It was running wild. I would be exposed to people and languages that I didn't even know existed. I would travel in their caravans and would observe the differences between caravans. I would cross the Great Nile River at least twice I might make a side trip to Ethiopia and see the source of the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile and White Nile come together in Khartoum, Sudan to form the Nile. If the trip went well, then such travel would probably become my career. I had thought I might then go on and travel throughout Sub-Sahara Africa with the same effort. 
Such a trip could also prepare me to do a similar thing in Central Asia and travel with and among the nomadic cultures there. Both of these additional trips would be in areas larger than the United States. I then would have lived a life comparable to Richard Burton. I could then, like him, spend the last couple of decades of my life writing about what I had observed, experienced, and learned. I would have been able to provide the world with the information on these cultures, their way of life, and from a unique perspective, particularly from the way I would have went about these travels. I would live the life like an encyclopedia set that I couldn't put down while reading. I would create the greatest story to me that I could imagine. I also knew this could become a spectacular nightmare on so many levels. Death was only one concern among many. This was one of the most extreme deserts in the world. I knew sand and dust storms, little water, eating things I had never eaten, and eating things that would cause most people to excessively throw up would be part of it. This was before one could do an online search for information. I was concerned about their food, which I assumed would include raw meat and might take me to the point of a deadly sickness. Kidnapping, bandits, and battles to protect one's goods were common. I knew I would minimally be scarred by such battles. When water became short, we would have to drink camel urine. I would be exposed to the tetsi fly and sleeping sickness for the first time. I would continue facing many of the sicknesses I have faced throughout many of my travels in hepatitis A, cholera, typhoid, malaria, dengue fever, tuberculosis, yellow fever, schistosomiasis, and many others. I even saw a case of what to me looked like smallpox. This was several years after the last reported case, but I also knew nomadic populations wouldn't report diseases. In the next episode, I will continue with my offer to caravan across the ancient trade routes of Africa. Please support the channel by subscribing and liking. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next video.